for all the vegans and vegetarians out there, I hope I have not um, offended you. The that is not the intention, and uh, I'm just purely reporting. Okay, being a vet, and some of you may like this. <laughs> I go throw in some scientific papers. So there's so much scientific papers out there on diet. It was ridiculous. When I was searching it, it was just loads and loads and loads. So I thought I'll just pull out a few to spark a bit of interest, a bit of controversy, and uh, put it out there for this esteemed group of uh, dog uh, guardians to uh, peruse and comment and criticize as you want. So, this came out in Vet Science 2017. Okay, inaccurate assessment of canine body condition score, body weight, and pet food labels a potential cause of inaccurate feeding. Okay, so it's one thing me saying or one thing us talking about what sort of different foods is out there in the market, what do you want to feed, then actually getting the food and finding out how much to feed, okay? How good are people actually in feeding? I mean, I'm not talking about cho choosing the right food. Even if you chose the right food or the wrong food, how accurate are you in feeding your pet the right amount of whatever you're feeding? How good are you at assessing your dog's body condition? Considering 60% in UK uh, pet owners, they, their, their uh, idea of a fit, well, well, uh, sort of a size dog is um, unfortunately obese. Okay, how good are people gauging body weight? How many of you actually weigh your dogs to get a number, or is it just it looks okay? Uh, and how good are we reading pet food labels anyway? Because yeah, there's pet food labels back in the eighties. As I said, you know it was a requirement. Um, how many people actually read pet food? More in, more interesting question is how. Do you buy your dog's food? What triggers, uh, what triggers your buying pattern? How do you even choose? What are the factors that goes th goes through? Do you go through each food label? Do you go through what your friend told you? Interesting. So potential cause of inaccurate feeding. Okay, these are the results. So the abstract is that eleven percent of owners overestimate their body condition score, and ninety percent overestimate body weight. Okay, so only 48% of owners could accurately, could correctly estimate the dog's body weight. Okay, and only 23% and 43% of owners could correctly estimate how much wet and dry food to feed respectively. One in five and less than 50%. That's pretty amazing. Many owners are not aware of their pet's body condition score and body weight and cannot accurately interpret pet food labels. Further owner education to improve these skills is needed if dogs are to be fed correctly. I mean, forget about the, what was the best food for your dog. Come back to the question of how much are you feeding your dog regardless of what you're feeding. And these are the results, which is um, quite interesting uh, in my humble opinion. So, so food for thought, how good are we at actually getting the right amount? Do we follow the recommendation that's on label? Should we follow the recommendation that's on label? It's, I mean, I always use the example of when somebody asks me, how much food should I feed the dog? My answer would be, uh, it's like me trying to guess how much a five foot six woman should eat. God forbid, I wouldn't even go there. It's different for every single dog. That's the secret. You have to find out what your dogs need. Okay, and you have to know what body condition and the body weight to know how much, whether you're feeding too much or too little. And that is only by measuring it. It's not just a gauging from a distance. And uh, a, a term which I've learned in UK is a uh, ish, ish that much, you know, the body condition is ish, so to speak. So, yep, some food for thought, food for thought. Okay, the next one. This was in the Royal Society for Open Science in 2019, a fairly recent uh, paper. Wolf-like or dog-like, a comparison of gazing behavior across three dog breeds tested in the familiar environments. I found this paper very fascinating and interesting. I hope you find the same way too. Uh, 
So, okay, I know it's a bit of a wordy, I'll go through this slowly, okay? So, human-directed gazing, a keystone in human dog communication, has been suggested to be derived from both domestication and breed selection, influence of genetic similarity. So, you know, when your dog looks at you, okay, that, that's what I'm talking about, human-directed gazing. When they look at you, either from a distance, whether it's for food or whether it's for attention, that's what we're talking about, human-directed gazing, okay? So, bear with me. Um, and, and, you know, uh, you... Certain breeds, they gaze longer than other breeds, okay? So influence on genetic similarities to wolves and selective pressure to human-directed gazing is still under debate. So here we have used the unsolvable task compare, comparing uh, Czechoslovakian uh, wolf dogs or CWDs, which is a very, very close to wolf breed, German Shepherd dogs, which is arguably very similar to wolf as well, but not really, and finally the lovely bouncy Labrador Retrievers that looks nothing like a wolf. So in the solvo task, all dogs learn to obtain the reward. Okay, however, the different, uh, the uh, however differently from the. Uh, German Shepherds and the Labrador Retrievers, the uh, Czech wolf dogs hardly ever gaze at humans. So I'm talking about solvable tasks. It's very simple. Asking a dog to sit, okay? Uh, it's very, very easy to solve, okay? However, uh, how they have to do the sit first, then you give the food, okay? And what they found out was that the German Shepherds and Labrador Retrievers, when they sit, they give the food, they look at the human, okay, when they give the food establishing the human directed gazing whereas the wolf dog doesn't do that okay it just you know sits pass me the food i'm not even interested in looking at you okay in unsolvable task okay the wolf dogs gaze significantly less towards humans compared to labrador retrievers but not to the german shepherds okay so what it means is that although all dogs were similarly motivated to explore the apparatus the wolf dog and the German Shepherd spend a larger amount of time in trying to manipulate the, 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 the task compared to Labrador Retrievers. A clear difference emerged in gazing at the experimental versus owner. Okay. The wolf dog gazed preferentially towards the experimental, the unfamiliar subject manipulating the food. Okay. Whereas the German Shepherd towards their owners and Labrador Retrievers, they gaze at both because uh, independent of the level of familiarity. Okay, so what it's really saying is that if you give the dogs an impossible task, a very, very difficult task, that's more than just sit, okay? The wolf dog, okay, they don't even try to gaze at you because they know that they probably will not get the treat anyway, all right? And the wolf dog and the German Shepherd actually spend a larger amount of time trying to get it to work so they can get the reward in the end compared to Labrador Retrievers. Because Labrador Retrievers, literally, they just sit down and look at you. They don't, they're not even bothered about the task. They're like, if I look at you long enough, you give me food, so to speak. So, and also between experimental and owner, that's huge. Experimental is a complete stranger, okay? The wolf dog will look at experimental more because he knows there is food compared to the owner, okay? The German Shepherds more towards the owner because potentially they're much more loyal. They have that whole sense of um, so, uh, 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 familiarity with the owners. Whereas the Labrador just gaze at humans independently at both of them because I want food. That's how interesting it is. So in conclusion, it emerges that artificial selection operated on the wolf dogs produce a breed more similar to ancient breeds, more wolf-like due to a less intense artificial selection and not very human oriented. Um, yeah, personally, I found this uh, quite interesting. I found this in my sort of uh, when I was looking for food abstracts and food papers. And that's a little bit of a geek in me, I thought I'll share it. Okay, I believe this is probably the last one. Okay, so this uh, vet residency written in 2017. So, raw meat base diet influences the fecal microbiome and end products of fermentation in healthy dogs. Okay, so we're looking at how does raw food diet influence the fecal uh, bacteria, the microbiome, okay, and the end products of fermentation in healthy dogs. Okay, bear in mind the key with me, healthy dogs, all right? So what they found was that the aim of the study was to investigate the dogs, the influence of a raw-based diet supplemented with vegetable food on fecal microbiome in comparison to extruded food or dry food. So what they found was that a decreased proportion of lactobacillus and paralactobacillus and uh, privatella uh, genre was observed in the raw meat bone diet group in comparison to the dry food group. 
Okay, and what they found was that the raw meat bone diet uh, significantly decreased the fecal score, okay, and increased the lactic acid concentration in the feces in comparison to dry food. Okay, this result suggests that the diet composition modifies fecal microbial composition and end products of fermentation. The administration of the raw feed diet promoted a more balanced growth of bacterial communities and a positive change in the readouts of healthy gut function in comparison to dry food. So this paper fundamentally is saying that by giving a raw meat diet, it actually improves or betters the fecal uh, microbiome, the amount of bacteria, the sort of bacteria that is found in your dog. Okay, And uh, it certainly has got a much uh, better positive change in the sort of uh, talking about healthy gut function in terms of how much poop is being produced compared to raw food. So it's not uncommon for people uh, to or owners to report that once feeding on a raw food diet, the amount of poop is actually much, much less compared to giving a dry diet, which brings a very, very important or rather interesting point is that, example, if you give 100 grams of food and your dog only produces 20 grams of poop, arguably 80 grams has going to the dog compared to giving 100 grams of poop, sorry, 100 grams of food, and a dog produces, produces 80 grams of poop. Only 20% is being absorbed in the body. You're going to ask yourself, what on earth am I feeding? That doesn't go into the dog so much that it all comes out as poop. So, something to consider about is how much poop is your dog uh, pooping? And uh, if it's pooping that much, are you actually giving food that is nutritious? I do apologize. I do believe this is the this is certainly the last paper in the vet record, so a fairly established rec, uh, 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 magazine that is usually read in UK in the vet record and internationally, 2018. So they talk about zoonotic bacteria and parasites found in raw meat based diets for cats and dogs. Okay, so zoonosis just remember just to remind us it's uh, to spread from uh, animal to um, dogs, uh, from animals to humans. Okay, so feeding raw meat-based diets to companion animals has become increasingly popular since these diets may be contaminated with bacteria and parasites and may pose a risk. The purpose of this study is a test for the presence of zoonotic bacteria and parasitic, um, uh, sort of parasitic pathology in this Dutch commercial uh, raw meat-based diet. So they analyze 35 commercial frozen RMBDs from uh, 28 different brands, if I'm not wrong, from eight, uh, from, from, from eight different brands. And what they found was E. coli was isolated from eight products. Uh, extended spectrum uh, beta-lactamase producing E. coli was found in 28 products, 80%. Listeria was found in 54% and other listeria species in 43%, salmonella in seven products, 20%. Concerning parasites uh, con contain sarcocystis, which is not a nice thing to have at all, and another four uh, similar bartonella species. In two products, 6% of toxoplasma was found. The results of our studies demonstrate the presence of potential zoonotic pathogens in frozen RMBDs that may be a possible source of bacterial infection in pet animals and if transmitted pose a risk for human beings. If non-frozen meat is fed, parasitic infections are also possible. Pet owners should therefore be informed about risks associated with feeding their animals RMBDs. So this is a paper or this is a study that has spoken sort of not in favorable light of giving a raw food diet. Uh, similarly, this is just a paper. Why Dutch? Is it a particular um, issue in the country? Uh, what's a preparation? It's really, really hard to say. This is just reporting. So certainly we know that feeding, you know, a sort of a raw based diet or raw food diet uh, can have its issues. Um, but you know, there's a lot of pros and cons to that. I'll come back to that in a bit. Okay, something to talk about marketing. Okay, marketing. Actually, I tell you what, now I'm gonna have more time for questions. Okay, in summary, there are many diets available. As a dry processed food, it's still the market leader. Pros and cons regarding each diet. Research and understanding highly recommended for choice of diet. 
largely depends on owner's preferences. You, what do you prefer? How do you want to feed? Remember, marketing aims towards pet owners, not pets. How many of you actually bring your dog to the supermarket and test every single food to find out what's the favorite food? Or do we just go for the idea, whether it is a dry food, wet food, raw food, and the pictures on it, uh, and what is written on it, and make us to buy? Marketing is a whole different thing. Uh, so, you know, it's aimed towards pet owners, not pets. And uh, just a little bit about the raw food diet, you know, in my experience, if you are obtaining your raw food from a reputable source and you are preparing it, or rather you're, you're storing it properly, and this is where it gets a little bit hazy. Some owners, they are happy to store it together with their own food. Some owners, they prefer to have their own fridge or their own freezer to store it separately from that. Um, that's not right or wrong. Whatever rocks your boat, so to speak. Okay, uh, some some sort of uh, places where they sell raw food, they claim that their raw diet is as uh, or similar sort of standard or similar quality to human grade food, which means that it shouldn't make a difference whether it's stored beside your food or not. It's just the ideology behind it as well. Um, and you prepare it properly then, you know, in my experience, those owners who do that, they do not really have a problem with um, giving raw food. So the idea is coming back to what do you want? How do you prefer as well? And are you, are you a sort of uh, disciplined enough uh, or, you know, uh, prepped enough to produce a, to be able to produce a healthy uh, provision of a raw food diet to your pet? or are you going to slip up and potentially cause issues and hence giving a processed food may be more convenient and in the long term better for the uh, whole situation. You know, it, it all depends. There's no right or wrong to this. It's just everybody's different. All food must go to the lab for testing. 